Hello, welcome. So, I've got another story for you today, and this is uh, one version of a very common type of story that's common all over uh, Europe and particularly the British Isles. Uh, it's sort of a folkloric meme, if you like, that's sometimes called the King Under the Mountain. Uh, nothing to do with J.R. Tolkien, I'm afraid, although I expect these sorts of stories is where he got the idea from. Um, it's mixed with another sort of story, this as well, in this instance, another folkloric meme that's called uh, the Sleeping Warriors. It combines those two folkloric threads, this story. Uh, and I like to call it the Welshman, the Wizard and the Hazel Tree. Long ago, but not so long ago, a Welshman was driving his flock over London Bridge, where he found his path blocked by a dark figure, an Englishman, who accosted him and said, Where are you from? Well, the Welshman was a bit taken aback by this. After all, it was his right to drive his flock across London Bridge. And he says, I come from my own country. The Englishman said, I mean you no disrespect, but that staff in your hand, for he was carrying a neat staff of hazel, that staff in your hand comes from a tree, and beneath that tree is a great fortune. If you trust me and take me there, you will be rich beyond your wildest dreams. Well, what a proposition. <laughs> Now, uh, in those days, London Bridge, it was, it was kind of um, a slightly outside the law kind of place in many ways. So lots of sort of ne'er-do-wells and people on the fringes of society would live and congregate there, be they prostitutes or actors or usurers or fortune tellers or gamblers or, in this case, cunning folk or magicians, because that's exactly what this Englishman was. And this Welshman, he suspected that, that this man was either, either a charlatan or a wizard. And that Englishman, he, he saw that this Welshman's, you know, that was wavering slightly, and he said, look, look, don't believe me. Take your flock to market, and I guarantee you will be given a very good price. If that's the case, come back here tomorrow night, same time, midnight, and take me to your country. Well, very well then, said the Welshman. And he, he drove on through the night, and the next morning he went to the market, and for some reason, someone bought his entire flock for an unbelievable sum of money. He was more money than he had ever had, really. And he went out for a few drinks on the town, and then he was just crossing London Bridge again to go on his way back home, and his path, sure again, was blocked by a dark figure. And this Englishman, same man, said, well, did you get a good price for your flock? And the Welshman said, well, I did. <clears throat> and for some reason, you know, the, the, the Welsh in this time, they were pretty distrustful of the English, and still are sometimes. Uh, uh, but he, he, he took a punt on this guy and they rented two horses and they drove days journey all the way back across the south of England, all the way over across into Wales. And that Welshman, he remembered exactly where he had cut his staff of hazel from. It was a place called the Fortress of the Rock. Going up the misty, bare side of this hill with this wizard, this cunning man, this Englishman, strangely dressed, picking his way behind him. And there, sure enough, was an old hazel tree. And he saw, he could even see the very place where he had cut his hazel staff from it. In fact, he could see it was from the same tree, almost. And the Welshman said, this is the place. And the Englishman said, yes, yes it is. And they got to digging, both of them, two of them together. They dug underneath that hazel tree, uh, deeper and deeper down. And underneath, there was a wide, flat, stone and they shifted it and shifted the dirt around they worked quickly almost as if their work was being helped by some sort of magic because it was and they managed to lift this huge great uh, slab this sort of almost megalithic slab and up underneath there they burrowed under it and there was an opening to a cavern 
and the two of them crawled down carefully into that cave down deeper down and there was a narrow passageway leading down beneath the mountain uh, and the passage widened slightly and there was a huge bronze bell a huge bell and the, the wizard said to the Welshman do not whatever you do touch that bell and they managed to edge around it just slide past without touching it and there they went down and the cavern widened into a huge chamber huge natural chamber but it had also been slightly carved it had pillars in it with strange wonderful carvings from another time and there was a glow emanating from the end of that cave and as they crept closer they realized the glow was coming from the armor of sleeping warriors and these warriors were big guys and they had the most wonderful armor of gold and garnet all embossed and carved with entwining animals and strange mythical figures their helmets had beasts on them their shields were just the most exquisitely crafted things the likes of which had not been seen for hundreds of years and their swords and axes and spears and there, at the center of these warriors, was one warrior, his beard long. He was the most exquisitely dressed of all of them. And he had a great shining sword by his side. But that wasn't what the Welshman was looking at. His eye was drawn to a great heap of gold and a great heap of silver in the middle of those warriors. Now, at this point, the wizard turned to the Welshman and said, you can take as much as you like of either one of those piles of treasure, but only from one. You cannot take from both. Why? I do not know. Sometimes these folklores have strange rules. So the Welshman being, um, you know, uh, cunning in a certain kind of way, took from the gold, as I think you and I would as well. And he loaded his pockets, loaded his satchel till he was really weighted down with gold. And then he turned to the Englishman and said, aren't you going to take any? And the wizard said, oh, no, I have no use for gold. Knowledge is what I seek. So they made their way, being careful to step over these sleeping warriors whose armor illuminated the whole cavern as if from a thousand flaming torches. And they picked their way gradually back up through the narrow passageway up to the surface. And the wizard said to the Welshman, be careful, whatever you do, do not let your bag hit that bit too late. Bong! And the sound rang out throughout the whole chamber, on and on and on, it rang, shut up. And then the closest warrior to them <coughs> woke up and turned to the, to the wizard and the Welshman and said, is it day? And the wizard <laughs> very quickly said, no, it is night, sleep thou on. And at that he, satisfied, <coughs> went back to sleep. <coughs> A lucky escape. And they snuck past the bell and out to the surface. Now, they were picking their way down the misty hill and something was on the Welshman's mind. And, and finally he asked, who were those warriors? Who was that great king that slept among them? And the Englishman turned and said, that, my friend, was King Arthur. And he is sleeping under that hill until one day in the future when a gold eagle and a black e eagle will fight in the sky and their fight will be so terrible that the very earth will shake that bell will ring and arthur and his knights will spring back to wakefulness rise out of the hill and drive the enemies of britain the enemies of wales out off the island forever and wales will reclaim the whole of britain like it once did now to more practical matters the englishman turned to the welshman and said you have there in your satchel more gold than you should ever need if you spend it prudently but if by some accident or misfortune you happen to fritter away all this gold you know where to go but remember do not touch the bell and if for some reason you do touch the bell and one of the warriors wakes you know what to say immediately without hesitation 
you say, sleep thou on, and all should be well. So the Englishman and the Welshman parted ways, and the Welshman went back to his village, and he was a very, very wealthy man. <laughs> the, the, the money he got from his flock was as of nothing. He now had great riches. He uh, bought himself a nice pub. He bought himself an entire village. But as the years went by, such was his generosity of spirit, he frittered away all of that gold until he had nothing left. But he remembered, he remembered the hazel tree up on the fortress of the rock and he managed to find his way to the very same tree yet yeah, he had his hazel staff it was certainly the same tree and he dug away and sure enough under there was a slab of rock and he dug it took him days and days it was so much quicker the last time but finally he managed to uncover the hole beneath the mountain and down he went sneaking past the bell stepping over the worries helping himself to the pile of gold but not the silver he remembered that much but so greedy was he that on his way out he again touched the bell and he was very out of breath and the nearest warrior woke up and said is it day and the Welshman said, uh, uh, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? Too late. Another worry awoke and another one and another and another and another and another and another. And another. They were like, they were like little, little meerkats just, just popping up. <clears throat> and they arose and there was a great commotion. They grabbed their warriors and they went to him and they realized, they realized what had happened. It was not the end of days. The great eagles were not fighting in the sky. It was just some bloody bugger had come to nick the gold and they gave him such a beating, took the gold off him and they beat him black and blue that he was crippled for the rest of his life. And they boom, chucked him out the side of that mountain and he rolled down the hill in a great broken heap on the floor. Mm. And they sealed up the mountain again. And the Welshman crawled back to his village and related his tale, but no one would really believe him. And he never really recovered from his injuries. He was a cripple for the rest of his life and poor. And though he told many people of the place under the hill and managed uh, to even um, get some volunteers, some, some other villagers to go and dig up the whole mountain, but he couldn't really find the tree and couldn't really find the same place again, even though they had pretty much dug up the whole mountain. That opening was sealed. And that, my friends, is the story of the Welshman, the wizard and the hazel tree, or the king under the mountain and the sleeping warriors. warriors. So, a story of King Arthur coming again to drive off the enemies of Britain. <laughs> In the British Isles, there's three different places that have a similar story uh, associated with a sleeping king, the sleeping king, Arthur. Uh, one of them is uh, like that story there. Um, uh, one of them is Arthur's seat so in Edinburgh. You might have been there. Uh, the other one is here in the West Country. It's um, at Glastonbury Tor, which is sometimes called Avalon, the island of apples. Uh, so a few different places associated with King Arthur. Um, so this is one, uh, uh, this is, uh, as I said at the beginning, it, it's, it's a type, it's like a folkloric meme. You get it in lots of places. Uh, when I used to live in Denmark, uh, they've got a guy called Holger Danske, uh, who also will come and fight off the enemies of Denmark. Uh, Finn McCool in Ireland, he is sleeping underneath Ireland somewhere, waiting for a great hunting horn to ring. And then Finn and all of the Fianna will come and fight away the enemies of Ireland. There are similar stories in Germany, in Latvia, all across, um, all across Europe. Europe. Um, so it's a very common cultural motif. Um, I guess it's, uh, I guess whenever a population has been cowed into submission, uh, you, you get you get a culture hero, uh, so King Arthur in the case of Britain. But, um, but ironically, uh, uh, that thing happened also to the to, to the Anglo-Saxons, the Normans came over and dicked on them a little bit. And uh, the king that died then, Harold Godwinson, he's supposed to be under a hill somewhere in Wessex. Um, even more modernly, Sir Francis Drake, who fought off the Spanish Armada, if it, Britain is ever in trouble again, if you bang his drum, he's supposed to rise out of the sea, okay, this time, and fight off the Nazis or whatever threat the Russians are, um, uh, are threatening these shores. So it's a very common thing. Um, and a very understandable human thing to uh, to um, put your faith in in, in a quasi historical or historical culture hero, but there's a much older idea going on here, um, 
uh, this type of story is probably much older than Legends of King Arthur. They probably go right back into Celtic and pre-Celtic times, probably right to the Bronze Age and earlier, where the idea is that the king is connected to the well-being of the land itself, uh, sometimes the fertility of the land. Uh, sometimes if the land is ailing, that's because the king is, is not acting in a morally just way. Um, sometimes a solution of this is actually sacrificing the king to the land, and sometimes that can make it fertile, save it again. So it's this very old idea that the king himself is connected to the land, and you see this in a lot of folkloric ideas. Um, uh, and we can extrapolate that also as meaning that, 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 that we, you know, as, as kings in our own um, sort of psychological universe are connected deeply to, 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 to the land, the mythos of the land. So that's um, it's a very, very old idea here encoded in, um, in this particular folkloric story of the king under the mountain. So... We've all got sleeping kings and queens in us. Uh, let's keep them, let's keep them well. <laughs>